Hello and welcome to another edition of The Chamber right here on City TV. My name is Duke Ben Sopoku. This week on The Chamber, we're speaking to a very exciting personality uh, who's made his mark when it comes to the country's politics in Parliament and, of course, in the Yekufuado administration. My guest is the Honorable Alexander Aban. When I'm back, we'll get into an interesting discussion. Stay with us. You're welcome back from the break. The Honorable Alexander Kujokom Aban. Welcome, sir. Thank you, sir. Uh, thank you for welcoming us into your beautiful office. You're welcome. I think our, our, our viewers would be interested in knowing about your early life, your beginnings, how 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 your I mean your formative years looked like that shaped the kind of um, person that we are speaking to today. Thank you very much. Uh, I was born some forty-seven years ago to some two very very poor persons uh, at a village called Gumwa de Rampan in the central region. Um, let me state here that I have got here by the strong hand of God because uh, by the story that I have, I did not have the formative years of what I may call normal family life okay. because I did not come to meet my parents living in Amity. So, uh, and the history has it that by age six months, whatever the reason was, uh, I cannot fathom because my parents never told me. They were trying to uh, throw blame and counter blame at each other. But the truth is that by six months, I was in my father's house. So that's uh, where I grew. And then I went to uh, my village, uh, Saito School, uh, um, St. Joseph's Catholic Primary School. Uh, did that up to Form 4. Okay. Then uh, the most critical period uh, came. The most critical period has always been going to secondary school because once you're able to cross that, then probably you can have some chance of uh, having some good life uh, in the future. But like I told you, my parents were extremely poor. They're part of the core poor, and I don't say this with any apologies because that's the truth. So when I got to elementary form three, um, I sat and passed what you call a common entrance uh, from that village setting. And I'm proud to say that I got a call up to uh, be at St. Augustine's College. So uh, it should have been one of, you should, to get to that, we are told that at the common entrance, I mean, I, we, we were not privileged to have, read, to have written that, but I'm told that it, 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 the school selected the very best, I mean, for such, a, for such a school, to qualify to get into such a school, it means you are one of the best across the country. My village school, my village Catholic school, as far as uh, Gumwa uh, was concerned at that time, was one of the best. Okay. And it always uh, prides itself with the motto that it's either the best or with the best. Or either the first or with the first. So um, it did not come as too much of a surprise. But I say this in thankfulness to God that uh, he gave me uh, some mental aptitude to be able to grasp uh, academic work. So uh, I got to Form 3, wrote the entrance, uh, common entrance, passed. Unfortunately, like I told you, my parents did not have the money. So I didn't go to the secondary school. And I was dreading the day I would finish Form 4 because I knew that if I did and crossed the walls of Form 4, that was going to be the end of all academic pursuits that I thought I could have. Even though, in my own mind, I felt I had what it was to pursue secondary education and probably uh, higher after that. Then came a Catholic priest uh, when we were in Form 4. He came to speak to us on vocations that they were looking for students who could subject themselves to the Catholic discipline and education, and then finally uh, get themselves enrolled in the holy orders to become priests. It was my headmistress who even went to tell the priest that 
uh, this man, this small boy, we think uh, has what it is to uh, write the entrance exams and pursue um, a calling into the priesthood. So uh, I readied myself to go and write the exam. Then I realized, to my greatest disappointment, that I could not do so because I had not even been baptized as a Catholic. Oh, even though I was going, yes, even though I was going to church and all that, uh, I had not been baptized. So uh, I quickly had to go through catechism. Uh, and I was a catechism teacher myself because at that time it was by rote. So you would just read and imbibe it and all that. So like what we would call true and four. So uh, we did that. And thankfully, uh, I was baptized. And I went to write the exam, uh, I think somewhere in uh, uh, 1998. Uh, no, 1989. Yes, 1989. And uh, uh, here, I'm humbled also to say that of the 111 candidates that went to write the entrance exam to St. Teresa's Minor Seminary, I came as the best uh, student. So that's how... That's uh, in Emisano. Emisano, yes. Okay. So I had Form 1 to Upper Sex in Emisano. Wow. And uh, uh, so um, in September of 1989, I went to St. Teresa's Seminary. Going itself was a difficulty uh, because I've, I cannot say it any more than I have done that my parents were very poor. So uh, I could not get most of the things on the prospectus, but I had to go anyway. Uh, so I went with uh, my friend, who is now a Catholic priest, uh, Francis. And we had a senior there, uh, Father Joe. So uh, we went together. And uh, when I got there, the reality actually dawned on me especially when we finished with the first term. Then I realized I did not even have a bag uh, because I put everything that I had uh, in some trunk uh, that uh, my mother had left there. But at that time, my mother was uh, in Nigeria uh, looking for greener pastures, if I may put it that way. So I had to return with uh, a protein bag. At that time, those days it was done I think in Cote d'Ivoire, we had the elephant on the one side and uh, uh, the calendar, the calendar year on, on, on the other side. So that's what I put my few things in uh, and then came back. But when we went to uh, form, uh, I mean, the second term, our result did not come. So when we went to second term, then uh, I was told I was second in class. Uh, and all this while, I think the priests were watching me and they could feel palpably that I was going through some difficulties. That was when, unknown to me, they wrote to my parish priest uh, that they had found in me a very good student, but they could feel that I was going through uh, a lot of financial challenges. So if he could try and look for some benefactors to support my uh, pursuit towards the priesthood. So uh, one day I had come back from uh, the seminary on vacation. Then came Father George, may he rest in peace, with uh, a man that I knew hazily from a distance. So when they came, uh, they took me somewhere, and uh, I could hear the priest telling this man, which I knew from a distance, that, oh, Kwamina, uh, this is the young man that I want you to take off. Um, so the story was then taken up from there by uh, this Mr. Kwamina Aban. So he asked me, young man, how did you, oh, who is your mother? I mentioned my mother to him, and he realized that he didn't know him. He didn't know her at all. So he asked me, how did you come by your name, Aban? Who is your father? So when I mentioned the name of my father, then he told uh, the priest, oh, father, 
this young man is my child. Uh, there was a need for some kind of explanation. So the only explanation was that uh, he is the step or the half brother of my father uh, by a different uh, another mother. Or, uh, so uh, he quickly asked me to leave. Uh, that was the end of the deal. So he came home, uh, spoke to my father, and before long, I had been invited to go and see Mr. Kwame Naban at Aguna Suedru. There, I had to go with my prospectus, and everything was bought anew. So that was when I got a bag. That was when I could put on something that uh, looked like, yes, uh, a student's uh, uniform and all that. So that's so, Providence weaving its way through right from the ramp up, 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 to, up, to, up to a Misano. Um, I have, I've read in um, Archbishop Kwisi Sapon's memoirs about how he had to go to the place himself out of, um, at the time he was taking the place, he did not want to go, but found a place that he could actually mold and set, and set it up in a way to produce great people for, 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 for the Catholic priesthood. I don't know if um, you, at the time you, you, when you met uh, him or you met some of his imprints at, the t at, 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 at that institution? We heard their names, but the point is that at the time I was going to the seminary, he himself was already an archbishop. Oh, okay. So uh, it should tell you the age gap between it, okay. the time that he entered the seminary and the time that I went there. But many, uh, many people will be curious to find out how, the, I mean, so, so from one to seven, or for seven years, one to um, four, one six. to five, then upper six, we left to, to, to um, the University of Ghana? No, I even proceeded a little more. Okay. Uh, went to St. Paul's Seminary for two years. Okay. Uh, and so I actually wore the cassock for a year, a whole year. Wow, as a, as a priest? Yes, as, uh, if I say, a, a trainee a priest, priest. If I put it that way, uh, because I was still in the seminary. Mm -hmm. Before I took what I may, I, I, I may describe as a very bold decision, to uh, leave that, uh, the process towards the Holy Orders and then went to the University of Ghana. What, what informed that decision? It is not something that I'm going to discuss in public, okay. but I tried to discuss it within what I would describe as the internal forum with my spiritual director. Okay. We talked about it extensively before I finally took a decision to let go of the desire to become a priest, and then I proceeded to the University of Ghana. Okay, so tell us about the University of Ghana and um, how different it was from what you had gone through maybe for, for, the, uh, for about eight or nine years of your life. You see, when I went to the seminary, the place was uh, very serene for academic work and uh, discipline is something that you cannot compromise with. And sometimes when I want to brag, I only ask people, have you ever seen a daft Catholic priest before? No, because no matter what, they will make you learn. You will learn and you also uh, uh, learn how to behave yourself well. So uh, I had seven years of training there, did my O level, uh, thankfully had a distinction, and then uh, came to the A level and uh, besides the academic work, I also had the opportunity uh, to exhibit my uh, God-given talent as a leader. So uh, I became the SRC president uh, in the minor seminary, Ebisano, and uh, at least the feedback I get, even now, is that sometimes they cite me as one of the best student leaders uh, they had produced uh, in, in, in the seminary. So I proceeded to the major seminary at Sotum, and there too, uh, because I was in double minds trying to get to the university, I decided not to put my hat in the ring to become uh, SRC president. But surprisingly, when we, they did not get enough people to file nominations, uh, there was a general nomination which was done by student voting and I was voted there and finally got elected as SRC Vice President. And it's understandable because after all, you yourself, you do not put up 
yes. uh, yourself as a candidate. So probably I could have become the SRC president. But even as SRC vice president, I did so well. And I, I commanded a lot of respect uh, on campus. So uh, I decided to move to the university. It was a big blow, uh, shocking to the formators, because uh, I could feel uh, that uh, they found in me one of the um, promising, promising uh, 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 priests, if I should put it that way, uh, up, up and coming priests. And uh, when I shared my uh, desire to leave with some of my mates, I don't know what they saw, but some even could tell me that, hey, young man, don't go, because all the things that you're doing, you are just preparing yourself up to become a bishop. So why are you doing this? But you know, that one is the calling of God. So I did not have any such wanton ambition within the uh, uh, church uh, hierarchy. So I left for the University of Ghana. Okay. So the life in the... Yeah, so uh, on, on, on the note of, uh, uh, well, let me see, Alexander Alban, the priest or the potential priest who's decided to go to the University of Ghana, we'll take a break. When I come back, we'll take it out from there. This is still the chamber. We'll back after the break. Stay with us. You're welcome back from the break. This is still the chamber. We left on the note of um, Alexander Aban, potential priest, who's now decided to go to the University of Ghana. So, the, the Honorable Aban, uh, University of Ghana experience for you, how was it like? Good. Uh, a, a bird whispered into my ear that you were in the Vandal City as well. Yes. So, I entered the University of Ghana. And uh, I chose to be in Commonwealth Hall. The only reason why I chose to be in Commonwealth Hall were two. One, um, because it's all male hall, and with my background coming from all male school, it would be easier. That's what I thought. The second and most important was that the only person I knew in the university from my area was in Commonwealth Hall. Okay. So I could be in close proximity with him and have discussions and all that. To be honest with you, I had what I may describe as cultural shock. Okay. Having regard to my background from the seminary okay. and getting into Commonwealth Hall with all our uh, plate of songs that okay. we sing there and all that. So that was a cultural shock. But uh, I quickly got myself, uh, got myself in, uh, I mean, integrated into the system. And, uh, before I realized uh, I was making uh, a name. Mm -hmm. The reason being that I was a prolific writer. Okay. And uh, like I said, having learned some Latin and some Greek, uh, I could write impeccable English at that time, even at that level. And any time that I wrote article, not only the language, but also the content uh, were enough for people to be reading and to be asking, uh, who is this, who is this, who is this? Uh, so you could see uh, comments like A++ and all that and all that. So a lot of people knew the name Alex Aban, but did not know who uh, the person was. And on occasions that we went to uh, meeting at the observatory, uh, anytime I picked a topic to discuss, I realized that I held uh, my audience spellbound. They were quiet to listen to me and all that. So that's how it started. Uh, who is that? Who is that? Who is that? Until uh, people came to ask me if I wanted to uh, run for office in the university. I politely turned it down and told them that it's not as though I could not. but the kind of financial outlay in this, I'm not cut for it. Not that I could not do it. So I had to even tell them my background as SRC president in uh, the minor seminary, SRC vice president in the uh, St. Paul's seminary, and then uh, school prefect in my village school, just to prove a point that, yes, what they thought they had seen in me I had actually displayed it earlier, but I did not have the money to contest the way they wanted me to do, because uh, running for office in the university was quite
quite expensive. But they insisted. So I told them that instead of SRC, I would rather want to do uh, JCR. JCR, which they agreed. And so I started the uh, campaign uh, without a schoolmate, without a classmate. Um, but I had some people from St. Um, uh, Pope John's Secondary yeah. School, who by reason of my uh, coming from the seminary, decided to associate with me mm -hmm. to say that I'm a Pujoba. Mm -hmm. So uh, I got the Pujoba people to be my core constituency within the hall. And on and on and on and on, I contested and became the JCI president mm -hmm. of Commonwealth Hall. That's huge. Yes. Because this Commonwealth Hall JCI presidents are usually the, what you'd call the, the anti the, the anti-management type, always speaking for the very ordinary student, if I may put it that way. Yes, I And assume. there's a lot of pressure on Commonwealth JCR presidents because everybody in the hall has an opinion that they think the JCR president... If you look at how the council meetings are, are organized, everybody has a say. And if you don't deliver, you will be impeached. Yes, we will talk about impeachment very soon because <laughs> in, in, in uh, Commonwealth or uh, somewhere, somehow, you may be threatened with uh, impeachment. Um, I became JCI president. It was going very well. Uh, then some misunderstanding uh, crept in. It was misunderstanding between the accredited leadership that I led, okay. that's the elected leaders and then the chief vandal and his outfit. It has been a very powerful institution in the hall. But the crop of chief vandal and his group that I, I, I had, for one reason or the other, uh, did not exhibit the uh, spirit of vandalism, the way we describe it in the hall. Because you see, uh, the differences were that they would organize some program and would try to uh, make some kind of unhealthy profit out of it, which by my uh, uh, background was quite alien to me. And I felt that that was the breeding ground for corruption, right? So they would bring some uh, ridiculous uh, budget to maybe buy bananas for uh, the CVC choir and all those kind of things. And uh, before they realized I have brought the drum myself or I have so things were not going very well. Okay. Then uh, uh, it got to a head when they felt that I was a stumbling block mm -hmm. to uh, their progress mm -hmm. in this sense. So they fomented some uh, troubles and uh, created some trump up charges against me uh, that they wanted to impeach me. Uh, we went through that whole process again and thankfully uh, they could not uh, mash out the numbers to impeach me. But thereafter, the tension in the hall was just so much that the hall master at that time, Professor Harry Akusa, invited the old vandals in. And that was the beginning of how I got into politics. Okay. So everything probably is providential. Yeah. Because when the old vandals came, obviously they wanted to know the facts which had led to the tension between the accredited leadership of the hall and the traditional leadership, as we call them. Uh, so we went to uh, KEK, may he rest in peace. We went to his house at Hachu with some old vandals, including uh, my boss, Kweku Ajimamenu, uh, Geoffrey Kobla, Nkachia uh, Sapo. Geoffrey Kobla, may he rest in peace. So we went there. After going through all the facts, then the old vandals were shocked. And they said that my only crime was that I was protecting students' purse. And that was the only reason why the chief and his outfit were trying to get rid of me so that they could have their way. It was that singular act which made the old vandals decide that it was necessary that they assisted me and pushed me into national politics early enough because they felt that with what I had exhibited in the university, if I continued like that and became president, even in this country, I could change 
the fortunes of the country. And that's how I entered politics. Well, that's uh, recognizing some st strong streak of ethics at, the, at, that, at, that, at, that, at that level. But we, we, you didn't tell us what you, what you, what you read and how that, that, that dovetailed into the legal career or law career that you're pursuing. Okay, as far as the academics are concerned, when I went to university, my real intention was to read law. Okay. But I was not given that course to read. Okay. I read uh, geography, uh, archaeology, and classics. Okay. But I majored in geography. Okay. But at the back of my mind, I knew I was just using that as a step uh, to move to what I really wanted to do. Okay. So immediately after the um, first degree, I did my national service as the alumni relations officer for Commonwealth Law. Okay. And immediately after that, I applied to go to uh, the Faculty of Law. So I actually lived on campus for six years. Wow. Okay, going through all of that. We'll come, we'll come to the issue of legal education later on, which is something that is very, very, very important, especially looking at the incidents and what has happened this week. But so, I mean, this encouragement for old, old, from old vandals got you into, in, into politics. And I'm sure you also, after you became a lawyer, um, you also had ex experiences to boost your, I mean, your, 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 capacity, your capacity as a lawyer. I'm, I'm asking these questions because I want to find out how all these dogs connect, connected before you got into, I mean, represent the people of Gomua, Gomua West. Okay, so this is the story. The old vandals who mooted the idea at one of the meetings and uh, decided to uh, finance it were from both sides of the political divide. Uh, just that I don't want to mention names, but you could find that the only common denominator was that we were all old vandals, but some were persuaded towards NDC, others persuaded towards MPP. But the common thinking was that this is a good person who can uh, bring some kind of change uh, in the future. So let us just push him into national politics. So I had my first primaries in 2003. Okay. Yes, I was a student at the Faculty of Law then. So um, I went and did so badly by way of votes. Uh, because at that time, uh, I had only eight out of 111 votes. Uh, we were five that contested. And I was the last uh, in a rural constituency, you must understand. Mm -hmm. A young man, not married, schooling, not rich. Uh, not working, all these social uh, defects were odds against me. Yeah. So having been introduced to it that way, after losing it, uh, I was already in the law faculty. Okay. So I completed the law faculty in 2004, proceeded to uh, Makwala or the law school, okay. and then got, got called to the bar in 2006. In 2008, I decided, and for genuine reasons, that our candidate, Joe Hackman, who had won uh, the primaries in 2003 and proceeded to win the seat uh, against the formidable person in Amma Benyuado, may she rest in peace, uh, it was necessary to give him the free hand to contest again. Uh, he won the primaries and that's some uh, uh, controversial circumstances. So there were a lot of people who, though MPP, decided to kick against him in the general election. And that's how he lost in 2008. Then 2012, I contested and lost in the primaries. Then 2016, uh, that's 2014, in the run-up towards 2016, I contested again, won and then proceeded to win the seats uh, for the first time. And that's how I got elected to represent the good people of Goma West. Yeah, and for a first time, um, Member of Parliament came with Vice Chairman of the Legal, Constitutional Legal and Parliamentary Affairs Committee. That's a very big role, I mean, to, to give to a very first time MP. He went on to become Deputy Communications Minister and, I mean, health, 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 health Minister as well. Tell us about your experiences in Parliament and 
what you think can, can be done to make the institution better? Yes. Thank you very much. Now, when I got to Parliament, um, I realized that uh, some of the things that we were called to approve came so late that if you were not very dutiful and conscientious to actually contribute to the discussion, you would not read anything until it got to the point of just uh, raising your hand or uh, shouting for its approval. That's one area that I think we must look at because the purpose of parliament, one of it, is uh, oversight responsibility over the executive. And so if you are going to oversee somebody's work, then you must grasp it very well to be able to understand why certain line items have been listed for expenditure and all of that. But if you don't get the uh, report and uh, uh, the necessary documentation for you yourself to read and understand, then you realize that you will not be able to exercise your uh, function very well. Okay. The other thing, which is also the deliberative one, uh, also even springs from that. Because if you're going to deliberate on uh, an issue, and uh, you yourself, you are not very well versed, you are not prepared, how are you going to speak? The other thing has to do with the individual trying to beat fear out of you. Because when you get to parliament, for me, I always said to myself that you had nothing to fear except fear itself. And once you're able to beat it, you should be able to communicate freely uh, on the floor of the house. It is just unfortunate that sometimes uh, the aura of the place, which creates some kind of intimidation and inner inertia on the individuals, gets some people do not, uh, who would not even utter a word. Not necessarily that they are daft or they are stupid, but that they would not even master the confidence and the courage to even contribute to the discussion on the floor. Um, it is just unfortunate that I did not get the nod from my people again. I believe that if I had, uh, probably I would have given a shot towards uh, uh, leadership yeah. in, in, in the house because I think I was not doing badly at all. Uh, it's unfortunate that when you're coming from the rural constituency, these are not the things that they look at. They are looking at you as a proxy for development. And so government has not done this road. Uh, we are looking for this, we have not got it. And so the, the, we have to just vote against the uh, parliamentary candidate or the MP. Uh, sometimes it also has to do with the orientation that we have. In some places you go there, uh, they see it as though it's a religion. Yet, 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 so that's it. In my constituency, uh, they vote NDC a lot. And so you have to do a lot to be able to uh, convince them, right? But that road was a big, 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 big blow to uh, me and to uh, probably my aspiration in the chamber. Yeah. But, but uh, uh, if, if not, to, not to cut you, sir, but if, if you, I'm sure you've done an introspection over the period. What could have been done better in your term to, to because I mean, it looks like it was a it was a ripple effect across the coastal zone. Most of the seats, the MPP lost in, in, in uh, won in 2016. They lost in 2020. Yes, in some places, the MPP became the collateral beneficiary okay. of some bottled up anger of the constituents against NDC for unfulfilled promises. Okay especially in my case, I will talk about the road. Okay. So once I came, the, <coughs> the, the, their level of tolerance for MPP uh, is much uh, 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 smaller okay. than the level of tolerance they have for NDC. NDC hasn't, done it. Uh, NDC hasn't done it in four years. Okay, they can agree to give, give them another four years to see if they will do it. But MPP, you come, and in four years, if you have not done it, oh, they can't tolerate you going another time. So, like the Hackman, uh, Joe Hackman, whose name I mentioned, mm -hmm. he got it in 2004, and by 2008, they, he saw his exit. So, another NDC man came, took it for two times, and then 
I won it in 2016, and then by 2020, they had said goodbye to me. Uh, so these are some of the things. But one critical thing that I have found, which I think permeates through our politics throughout the country, is monetization. So you go to the rural constituency, the person thinks that uh, whatever you are doing at the macro level, he doesn't seem to have any benefit, direct personal benefit. And so if you have not given him five cities, he's not going to vote for you. Someone will tell you that, oh, for me, my thumb, I'm, I'm selling it. And I think the time has come for us to do some kind of serious introspection as a country and start educating ourselves because we are all guilty of it, the political class and the masses. Because the political class would go, try to go and uh, 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 induce people to vote with money. The same thing, they are also expecting to get the money, right? At the end of the day, if we are not able to get the right caliber of people in leadership, we, 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 we are not going anywhere. So I think it is very, very important that we start talking about the process of electing our leaders and then educating the people what the real role of an MP is. If we are not able to do that, before we realize, we will just get a bunch of, with all due respect here, and that's not what I mean, but we may get a bunch of stupid people just assembled in parliament by reason only of the fact that they had money and they could pay out. All right, on well, that note, we'll take a break. When I come back, we'll pick the thoughts of the Honorable uh, Alexander Abba on some very important, very critical current issues in the country. We'll be back after the break. Stay with us. Welcome back from the break. We're still having a very interesting conversation with the Honorable Alexander uh, Kujo Kom Aban. I'd like to mention the, the full name. Yes. So, uh, this, this week, the report of the Idra Committee, Justice Comsin uh, Committee, that probed the Idra unrest in the Ashanti region has has been released, the, a lot of commentary surrounding it. Um, but the major point, some have argued, is that the regional minister and the military officer on the ground, under whose watch all of these happened, did not really take the fall for what transpired. So compensation has been, recommend, um, has, there's been a recommendation for compensation for the families of the deceased. Other measures have also been put in place to channel the energies of the youth in the area properly and all of that. What would be your, say, general thoughts on the work of the committee? Thank you very much. Uh, let me start on a note of empathy okay. for uh, the families of those who died and, of course, those who uh, got injured in the crossfire. It is just unfortunate. And this would forever be a scar in the practice of our democracy. Um, you realize that uh, by the structure of our governance system, the head, the political head of a district, of a region, and of course the nation, becomes, uh, as the case may be, the head of security. So you have the DISEC uh, represented by the district chief executive or municipal chief executive, as the case may be. Then you have the Rexic, where the regional minister becomes the uh, head of uh, security. And of course, by our constitution, the president is also the head of security in the country. But what we should understand is that that conferment does not mean that people who are occupying those positions are, in terms of oppression, have the know-how uh, in dealing with security matters. And that's where the flaw starts from. We should only know that it is because of where we sit. That's why we have been given the power as head of security. But those who have the training to deal with security matters are themselves on the ground, the police and the military. In this Idra case, you realize that but for the intervention uh, which uh, became uh, a very bad intervention of the regional minister, things may not have escalated to this point. And uh, we may not 
uh, fought him too much, probably because it was a panic decision. I'm sure if he had called the Rexec for them to think about it, they would have found a very good operational way of dealing with it. Uh, the military were deployed over and above the uh, district commander there and even the district chief executive. And so uh, when I read the report and realized that a recommendation had been made for the uh, district commander to be transferred for his incompetence, I was taken aback a little. What did he do for him to have been described as incompetent? Because if his superiors had issued a command over and above him, what else could he have done? So uh, I have my own sympathies for so in essence, the uh, police uh, officer. You disagree with portions of the report? I may not necessarily disagree, but I felt that it was harsh as okay. far as he was concerned. Okay. Yes. So uh, probably if the uh, white paper is done and it becomes a judgment, probably he could go to court to challenge that portion. Because the thing is that once they have described him as incompetent, it's part of the record. Yeah. How is he going to proceed uh, or aspire higher on the ranks uh, to become IGP or to become COP or anything like, like that? Uh, because it may affect his career progression. That's, That's what I'm, Because if you say he's incompetent, why would you uh, transfer one incompetent person to another place? Is he not going to repeat the same? That's why I have my sympathies for uh, that police officer. As for the DC's removal, I think I agree. And in any case, he himself saw uh, the science coming, so he withdrew from the race for the appointment to the place as uh, DC. Um, compensation, uh, well and good, but I think it should be adequate, it should be timely, it should be prompt, it should be commensurate, so that uh, at least there will be some closure to it. But, it the, but the report was silent on the original minister. That's exactly what I was going to say. It appears to me that the regional minister and the military uh, seem to have had a full day. Even though, uh, shred of all the other things, the real issue uh, the, were caused by his uh, uh, ill-informed command mm -hmm. and the uh, obedience to that command by the military. Uh, because uh, I believe that um, he also has some mayor culpa to say to the people uh, that uh, he may have acted wrongly. Yes. Okay. Let's let's look at another recurring issue. You, I, mean, I remember your time in parliament it was one of the things that you also spoke passionately about, probably because of your your your, your diverse training in, in 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 the law. It's about the entrance exams into the law school. But almost every period, it becomes another major issue of contention in the country. This year, almost 3,000 students wrote the entrance exam, 790 students passed, almost 2,000. Would have to be, be try again or join the backlog of students that are currently still, I mean, many still struggling to get into, after doing the academic part, wanting to go do the vocational part or the um, BL or the Bachelor of, or the bachelor of Laws. The issue of reforms in legal education, how should it be approached? Thank you very much. Let me start by agreeing with the uh, former Chief Justice, uh, Madame Sophia Akufo, that a hundred good lawyers are better than 6,000 bad lawyers. Okay. But within that statement, it's a call for a balancing act. But before we understand this, and because we are educating the public, uh, let me do some little history of this so that people will understand how all these things came about. Okay. And I'm going to try and summarize it. And here I speak as somebody who has had the benefit of teaching at the law school for five years. So I was actually a faculty member at the uh, law school. The whole thing is historical. You know, in those old days, before you became a lawyer, you had to go to London, or you had to go to UK to go and 
learn law. So people like Acha, Aban, all those old names, they went to UK for legal education. Then uh, Kwame Nkrumah started the uh, oh Ghana School of Law, where with first degree, you could go and do two years QCL, Qualifying Certificate of Law, and then you will go and do, that's the academic side, then you go and do the practical side uh, for two years, and then you become a lawyer. University of Ghana started uh, law faculty. So in the whole of the country, we had only University of Ghana producing law students, feeding the law school. So in those days, they could admit, I mean, the highest they would admit would be about 80. Mm -hmm. So they would be in uh, Makwala and meet the stream that is coming from the QCL. Mm -hmm. So they would graduate. And when you got your LLB, it was just a seamless transition. You did not need any entrance exam. You did not need any interview. All you needed was to get your LLB from the University of Ghana, and then you continued. Then, over time, other public universities started running law programs. They were also joined in by private universities that sprang up. And surprisingly, all of them tried to uh, include law in their uh, the, co the courses that they were doing. So within time, there were a backlog of law, uh, I mean, LLB holders who were all trying to enter Makola. So this examination and all that became a saving procedure to get probably the creme de la creme. It is not to say that they are stupid, no. Because anybody who has been able to pass the LLB, at least, can be given some modicum of respect that he has some knowledge in the law or some proficiency in the law. So that's what happened. Uh, in an attempt to resolve that problem, Makwala didn't have enough space. So they had to create two satellite campuses one was on the campus of University of Science and Technology, Kwame Nkrumah University of Science and Technology in Kumasi. The other was in Gempa. And I remember very well that I had to travel to Kumasi every week to go and teach. So that was how it was to resolve part the of the issue problem. issue of space. Yes, the other problem was also to, um, I mean, what was also to, uh, I mean, take more people than the facilities could, uh, uh, could come accommodate. Now, this is the problem. Now, I don't think that they have enough resources to quickly put up uh, big, big buildings for accommodation of all students who have had the LLB, okay. right? What we must also know that is that in the case of Ghana, it is not like the UK where the very bright ones are admitted to the bar as uh, lawyers, where they call the, uh, the barristers, right? And then those who cannot make the mark are made solicitors. solicitors. In Ghana, everybody becomes a solicitor and a barrister at the same time. And that is where care must be taken. Because, to be honest with you, I've had the uh, privilege of teaching there. Sometimes you would read somebody's script and you ask yourself whether he passed through the walls of the law school. Because, you see, I mean, take it or leave it. The language by which we communicate the law is English. And sometimes you would read and realize that the person is not making any sense. So it does not necessarily mean that anybody who is holding an LLB certificate should automatically become a lawyer. So probably we should start looking at ways of making solicitors and barristers as one solution. The second thing is that when I went to the US, I realized that you finished the law school there, which is equivalent to our law faculties. Uh, you finished the law school. There's no other 
law school for practice where you have to go like Makwala. Mm -hmm. And so to me, it appears Makwala, the existence of Makwala has become anachronistic. Okay. It was established to deal with some problem. That problem doesn't exist anymore. And so to my mind, we should have a system where individuals could be uh, accredited to run the practical courses. By this, the General Legal Council should only be a certifying and an examining body, and then a regulatory body over our practice. Okay. In uh, the US, at least I can talk about the New York bar and the Massachusetts bar. They administer the exams in February and then in July, but they did not have any school of their own where they train people. So you go through your own training, either by yourself reading and going to do your own court rounds to see, or you go, just like the accountants do in Ghana, you go and have your own private tuition with the guidance of the syllabus produced by the Ghana School of Law, uh, uh, the uh, uh, General Legal Council, okay, so that you could go and write the exam. That would deal immediately with the space issue. So it, it would mean that the General Legal Council does not need to even go and put up uh, 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 school buildings, infrastructure. All they need to have is a proper administrative setup that will deal with administering exams, certifying them, and then regulating the practice. Just like the way we have uh, ICA Ghana, right? So the General Legal Council will then become like the WAEC of uh, uh, law exam. So that they do that, and after that, they will still have a continuing obligation in regulating our practice. If we do that, all this issue of our people going to Gambia to go and get called there, and they come and do the post call, and people going to Rwanda and all that, who sees? Yes, we need lawyers, but we need very good lawyers. Is there anything in the works? Do they, should they expect to come back from the Honorable Alexander Aban going into 20? 2024, we can fuse that into your final message and to your constituents. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, let me first thank the people of Goma West for at least granting me the opportunity to, to serve them for a term. In that uh, four year period, I'm sure I tried as much as possible to exhibit uh, what is in me. And that attracted the attention of the president to call me and uh, give me a ministerial, a deputy ministerial assignment or role to play, which I think I discharged creditably. Then when COVID came, I was assigned to become deputy communications minister. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, because my people could not bring me, uh, it's weakening the hand of the president to probably appoint me again. So while thanking them, uh, I must also let them know that uh, some of the grievances uh, were things that I could not have achieved because the road matter, it is for the government to do it. But I assured them that with all the discussions and the lobbying that we had done, that road was going to be done. And so they started before the elections. And even after the elections, it is so ongoing. And I'm staying, uh, saying here that it is the NPP government that is doing the road. And all the propaganda that is going on that the new MP has the magic wand and he's constructing the road uh, is to belittle our intelligence there. So I'm stating on uh, authority and with emphasis that uh, the road is being constructed because of the work that I did. Uh, and it is also the MPP government that is constructing the road. As to whether I would come back or not, uh, it is difficult for me to take a decision now. Okay. And the reason being that my own hometown, Gumwe de Rampo, they voted massively against me. Mm -hmm. And so I don't seem to have a base. Mm -hmm. And that actually hits me uh, very strongly. It cuts me to the quick. Mm -hmm. Because uh, uh, it appeared to me that with all the good things that I had done, even in the community and all that, uh, uh, they, they wouldn't see uh, eye to eye with my political opinions. And so if that is the case, why would you even uh, try again? But 
I hear a lot of uh, 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 words going on uh, showing that people have regretted what they did, but uh, that one uh, can only be within the rumor mill. We do not know if that is indeed the truth. Uh, but we are still around to assist uh, the community and Gomwe as a whole in whatever capacity that we find ourselves in the future. So if you can briefly talk to your people in your um, language to best understand. That's your camera. Mamu Fadam Akwen Jaido na menda Gomwe for Nkanka Hwana O Gomwe West. Menda Hwana Se. De Enfe Anana Waba Sonokwen Wunya Moho Eje Wunya Moho Do Na Waze Wani Tumisha Mene Seme De Mofano Sumwen Kakribiara ne meme de mutum mayen me ye. Mujiji de wa parliament no ye a beni meze na dodo na no wuhu de enche mezi gumwa wes nidi no mezro kosor. Na so em de monko fana wentum wan tasi ye na ekwana enche ufi and kamo other for the ram for the kwa fransen. Uh no sombo was a bomb bri. Mesha wan bo de damokwano or ye MPP aban no rutra. Na za oro kodi biara ye kansa kwa emi meka se oni tu oro kodi mi mda kwa ni ugudu wewe cha na ai mda kasa biso oro kodi de mpia oben ona ona mnenza dun tu wewe cha ende mi sini wewe akachira homu de onse dem na mama nda huma se na mesa so enkau fuma homu de abano obutu na oyimwa kuichu oni emi me mpi pia abano. Na matu tashau, they say, "Emio, so before phone years, my babo, I feel ye na ye mpe ye ye mukam funu. Gwana ye nkai de, abandi ba ya, inye bibi ya hena kuma wakake, ne mo mpunta ya yushen asbrehen, ne ye tumla ya abade ma abane, ma demu yase." Okay. So that's our wrap up this week's edition of the Chamber right here on CCTV. My name is Chukman Sopo, who had and the Honorable Alexander Kujokom Aban, a very insightful conversation personally for me, and I know it was as well for you. We'll be back same time next week on the same channel on CTTV. Keep watching CTTV for the very best in programming.